Hi everyone, thank you for clicking on this webinar. This is going to be webinar 6 of 8 in a series of 8 webinars. My name is Nick and today we are going to be talking about how to develop quality assessment tools. This webinar covers content from the TAE ASS 401 and the TAE ASS 502. This is going to be a bit more of a bulkier webinar um, for two reasons. One, the TAE ASS 401, its requirements has increased since the TAE has transitioned over to the new version of the course. So there's a lot of new criteria and a lot more um, stricter standards that needs to be met for the, um, completing that particular unit. And the second one is that the TAE ASS, so ASS 502 unit, um, that's a new core unit. So you may or may not have been able to complete it, in my opinion. These two units are very similar. Um, if anything, it's probably more to do in the TA ASS 401, but both units of competency concern planning and designing assessment tools. Not just planning and designing them, but making sure that they um, are of a high quality as well, because they need to be developed in a certain way. Okay, so as you can see on the screen, here are the learning objectives we're going to cover. So firstly, we're going to identify the most appropriate method for conducting assessments. So the method is what is the actual way we are going to collect the evidence. We're then going to look at developing an assessment plan, developing an assessment tool. We're going to look at accurately mapping competency standards to assessment tools. And we're going to look at how we can contextualize existing assessment tools to meet the needs of our learners. Yeah, so first up, we're just going to have a bit of a discussion point. So I mentioned before that um, the ASS 401 is a unit where its evidence requirements has increased. So let's talk about why that might be the case. So as stated in the Quality of Assessment in VET discussion paper, in a competency-based training system, assessment is the gatekeeper for quality. To ensure assessments are of a high quality, the assessment tools must first be of a high quality. This discussion paper released in early 2016, prior to the new release of the new TA qualification, hinted at the fact that some training organisations in some industries were using poorly developed assessment tools to assess their learners. As a trainer and assessor, you must understand the importance of using, of using high quality assessment tools as there can be many unintended and indirect effects of using poorly designed assessment tools. If you refer to the discussion paper, you might have noticed that one of the greatest rates of non-compliance of training assessment standards was related to early childhood education as determined by ASQA audits. I'm sure the learners completing the Diploma of Early Childhood Education and Care were being assessed in accordance with the assessment tool. However, the assessment tool itself might not have been of a high quality to begin with. One might wonder where the gaps are in the assessment tools, such as not covering all the competency standards or taking shortcuts in terms of recognition of prior learning. By taking shortcuts, the learner achieving the diploma might not have all of the skills necessary to perform in the workplace. Whilst the specifics weren't noted in the discussion paper, one might speculate what adverse effects this could have on the wider community. Other industries noted include equine programs and security. You can refer to the discussion paper for additional information on the quality of assessment in the VET sector. If you've already jumped ahead and had a quick look at the projects, um, you might have noticed that there's quite a lot to complete. When the previous TAE 4010 Certificate 4 and Train Assessment was updated to the TAE 4016, a key talking point was the quality of assessment tools within the VET sector. As such, the number of occasions the learner must plan assessment activities and processes was increased from two occasions to five occasions, where two of these occasions must be based on developing RPL assessments. All of the five occasions must be based on different units of competency and cover the entire unit of competency. So the requirements has increased since the previous version due to a perceived lack of quality assessment tools. Again, People completing the, the assessments might not have known any better, it's just the developers of the assessment tools to begin with just weren't hitting the mark. So there's certainly a bit to go through, however it is important that the assessment tools that you develop for, th for these projects are of a high quality. Um, further, when you're developing assessment tools, keep this in mind. 
If the quality of the assessment tool development is to improve on an overall nationwide scale, it needs to start from the foundations, the foundations being the completion of the assessment cluster. All right, so what is an assessment tool? The assessment tool is a very important document in the vocational and education sector. No matter how well your training and assessment strategy is, no matter how well you conduct your delivery sessions, it all comes down to how a learner's competency is assessed. So an assessment, con assessment tool contains the following documents. Firstly, the assessment instrument. Consider the instrument as a document used for measuring. In science, you have instruments that measure certain things, such as how a thermometer measures temperature. In the training context, the assessment instrument is, a, is measuring a learner's competency. The instrument itself should be able to provide this data. The assessment instructions. This can refer to both the learner and the assessor. It involves the evidence gathering techniques and procedures involved. So instructions to the learner on, hey, here's how you're gonna complete this assessment and instructions to the assessor for guidelines and benchmarks, which are um, incorporated in the assessor guide, which we'll talk about very shortly. The assessment tool also contains the assessment tasks. These are the instructions to the learner, which should tell them what tasks they need to complete. Assessment mapping. This is a document that justifies how your assessment tools measure the competency standards. We will discuss this in more detail later. Assessor guide. A guide the assessor uses to assess the learners. It contains benchmark answers and observations to ensure a valid and consistent assessment. So it's more or less a marking guide um, that an assessor would use to mark a learner's work. The key word there is it's being valid and consistent. The main question is, where do you pull the content from in order to create assessment tools? Do people who create assessments simply write what they think should be assessed? If this is the case, then why not only complete one or two questions, which in someone's opinion would be sufficient to show evidence of a particular unit? Well, this is where competency standards come from. Competency standards are the industry benchmarks required to, meet, to be met to demonstrate workplace outcomes. They include the performance criteria, required skills and required knowledge, amongst other components within a unit of competency. These competency standards are developed by industry and sets out the minimum expected level of skills and knowledge in order to perform workplace tasks. You can locate competency standards for a particular unit by researching the unit on the National Register for VET, which is training.gov.au. You'll be using this website quite a lot when completing your projects relating to this webinar. If you'd like a refresher on competency standards, you can go back to webinar one, which goes into details as to what competency standards are and how you can find them and how you can use trend.gov.au um, yeah, to, to find them as well. An assessment tool, therefore, is designed to gather evidence regarding the learner's skills and knowledge in demonstrating evidence in meeting these competency standards. For example, if you were to complete the TAE LLN 411 unit of competency as offered in the full version of this course, the assessments have been designed in order to assess you in the competency standards within that particular unit. Now, you might, not, you might have been unaware that these assessments were developed against these, but these assessments weren't pulled out of thin air. They were developed against these national industry standards known as competency standards. So, if you're an assessment tool developer, you can be fairly confident that if you were to complete um, if you enrolled into a unit of competency at one RTO, the assessment that you complete would be fairly similar to if you're completing at a different RTO, mostly because the assessments need to be measurable against the competency standards in that unit. So you don't need to assess any more. You definitely can't assess any less than the competency standards. So there's, some, there's a balance like a sweet point where you can um, get enough instructions out, enough clarity as to um, how the assessments are going to run without over assessing the individuals. When developing your tools, you should keep these concepts in the back of your head. First, the vet industry focuses on criterion-based assessment.
This means that all of the competency standards within a unit must be demonstrated in one way or another in order to achieve competency in that unit. This means that even if only one or two questions need to be readdressed in your workbook, it is important to realize that these questions relate to some competency standards which have not been met elsewhere in the assessment. As you need to demonstrate evidence of each competency standard, you are not compared to others in a norm reference type of assessment. As an assessor, it does not exactly matter how you compare to others, as long as you can demonstrate each of the benchmarks within a unit. In a similar light, high quality work is always appreciated and demonstrates your understanding of the content very well. However, as long as you can demonstrate evidence of each of the benchmarks at least once, unless otherwise specified, then you get a tick in that box. You should also consider the principles of assessment when developing assessment tools. The principles of assessment include validity, reliability, flexibility, and fairness. These principles of assessments are covered um, in quite a lot of components in the course, so you're probably very, um, probably very familiar with what they are. And same with the rules of evidence. So the rules of evidence are validity, sufficiency, currency, and authenticity. All right, so there are many different ways you can gather evidence from a learner in a formal assessment. Some examples of assessment methods um, can be identified a little bit later on in this webinar, such as right now. So what are some examples of assessment methods? For example, a written questionnaire, practical observation, and a simulation. The method would largely depend on some key items identified in the slide. When we're thinking about the method, we're thinking about the way we are going to collect the evidence. And what about the learning environment? Is your learning environment in a classroom, or is it in a kitchen, a salon, a shed, or online like the course you are currently completing? This can have a large impact on the type of method. As you've probably noticed, the majority of your assessments involve completing written questionnaires, case studies, and project types of assessment. This largely reflects the learning environment, which is online, as completing practical on-the-job demonstrations might not be so practical to begin with. Other learning environments such as the kitchen might require some practical demonstrations, such as demonstrating food preparation. This also specifically relates to the type of industry the learner is in. When you're considering which methods to use, you should also consider the nature of competency standards. When you're looking at the competency standards within a unit, you might have a difficult time determining the best method of assessment for some competency standards. As the competency standards are developed with workplace outcomes in mind, sometimes completing practical components is the only way for a learner to demonstrate their understanding. There are some required oral communication skills and facilitation skills which need to be assessed, of which it was determined that recording video content in a simulated or practical environment was one way of gathering this evidence. Other components, such as the required knowledge section, might only be accessible via written questionnaires or case studies or exams. It's knowledge. Develop some questions to assess their knowledge. The methods you use to collect evidence should also be based on the evidence gathering techniques. So these include direct evidence, whereby the learner completes assessment tools, such as questions developed by yourself or the RTO. Indirect evidence, whereby the learner demonstrates evidence of the competency standards based on implications, such as receiving third party report from an employer and supplementary evidence, whereby the learner can provide evidence of formal learning, such as from completed qualifications, which add strength to the learner's evidence of competency. Finally, it should be worth noting that when you are deciding upon assessment methods to use, that you should always try to use at least two different methods per unit. This largely reflects the principle of assessment known as reliability. If a learner can demonstrate their skills and knowledge using multiple methods, then you can make a more justified assessment decision. This doesn't mean that you should assess every single competency standard twice, but as long as the learner can demonstrate evidence in multiple ways throughout the unit, this should suffice. All right, so once you've identified some of the methods you're going to be using, we can now look at designing an assessment plan. So like most training procedures, you can't just dive right into conducting assessments unless you are fully prepared for the assessment. So it's essential to develop an assessment plan to accompany your assessment tool. The assessment plan is an overall planning document used to describe the who, what, when, where, why, and how of assessment. You might have noticed that in the assessment module, an assessment plan template which covers these details plus other essential items is in planning for an assessment. So please note that 
The assessment plan itself is usually an internal document, which in a practical scenario the learner would not see. I mean, after all, it's the RTO's plan of attack for assessing a particular unit or cluster of unit units in line with the RTO's policies and procedures. So just keep that in mind. It's mostly an internal reference document. So a major component of your projects for the assessment cluster involves developing your own assessment tools. You're welcome to focus on the samples and develop your own assessment tools based on these samples. To clarify, the assessment tool contains the instructions for conducting the assessment, the assessment instrument which is used to measure the learner's performance against the competency standards, a mapping matrix which justifies your assessment instrument, and assessor guides. The learner workbook you are currently completing through this course are examples of assessment tools which contains instructions and instruments. So as mentioned, please review the sample assessment tools for guidance and inspiration when you develop your very own assessment tools. Here are some tips on developing an assessment tool. So firstly, plan your assessment tool using the plan. Determine what methods of assessment you would like to use to measure the learner's performance. Secondly, download the unit's packaging details. You can probably print this out as a document will have all the competency standards and assessment conditions which will need to be addressed in your tool. And you can also develop the assessment instruments and mapping matrix simultaneously. In my opinion, the mapping matrix is the most important document you can have as a trainer and the process of mapping is also an important skill to learn, which we'll focus on shortly. Alright, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at an example assessment plan and example assessment instruments. Okay, so what we've got in front of here is one of the sample assessment tools from the supporting resources folder. This is sample assessment tool one, which concerns the BSB ADM 406 organized business travel. Now, definitely look at these samples when you're looking at completing your own. There are comments on the right hand side of these documents you can't, can't see in this recording, but there are comments basically explaining um, how some of this content was made up for the assessment plan as well as when we get to the assessment instruments. Your supporting resources should also have specific guidance on developing assessment plans and guidance on developing assessment tools. So please use these resources when you're creating your own assessments. So let's begin by looking at some of the components within an assessment plan. So just with a general overview, you can kind of tell that a lot of this information is fairly generic in a way, but it's also used for planning the assessment. So um, who's most likely going to be assessing it? Mr. RTO. Um, what's the purpose of the assessment? Why are people even completing this assessment? The target learner group. Okay, so this is who we might be expecting to be within the learner group. It's just a target learner group. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're only going to have people 18 years old and over or people who with who have interest in travel for example planning is really important as well because it also gives us time to look at the specialist support as well as some of the resources required for assessment so before an assessment is created we got to think what's some specialist support we might provide you know, in this case we're going to provide a workplace mentor and here's some of the resources which are required for assessment so computer, printer and scanner. Um, pretty important if you're looking at organizing business travel, um, access to internet and access to company server. So we're also looking at the assessment methods to be used and the assessment tools to be used. Now, again, when we were talking about the methods, remember we're talking about the way that you will be collecting the evidence. So for example, one method I'm going to use is written questioning. Written questioning is how I'm going to gather that evidence. This is in comparison to the assessment tool, which is the actual document which will be used to gather that evidence. So if I'm um, using written questioning as a method, I'm going to use a written questionnaire as the tool. That's the actual document that a student is going to complete. Okay. Same with, say, um, a practical activity. If it's a project, um, that's the method that they do a practical, whereas the way we record that evidence is using a checklist. Okay, you can also see that there's a lot of different, say, work health safety requirements, organizational requirements, 
ethical and legal requirements. Okay, so here's the evidence to be collected from the candidate. This is what we're going to be receiving. We're going to be receiving a completed written questionnaire. This is the evidence we're going to maintain on our files as evidence that the learner has completed these assessments. We're also going to look at different um, reasonable adjustment strategies. So we're kind of planning in case a learner needs a reasonable adjustment for whatever reason. So in assessment um, terms, one of the reasonable adjustments we're offering here is we're allowing the student to provide written answers due to a hearing impairment as opposed to verbally explaining it. We've also got here the timeline for assessment. So this is how long we should anticipate each assessment to be completed. We've then also got a host of um, technical administrative stuff which needs to be included as well. So the, the points that I was talking about just then, they're probably the, the key points. The, the, con the components which I haven't covered, they're not necessarily as important. They still need to be completed. They're just not as critical to the rest of your assessments. So um, when you're creating, before you create your assessment tools, you need to know what methods and tools you're gonna use. You need to know what evidence you're gonna be collected what you're going to be collecting rather. You need to know um, the timeline for assessment because all that information is going to be reflected in your assessment tools. Um, some of this information might be reflected in some of the instructions but it's not as critical. Okay, so that's um, an example of some content within an assessment plan. Again, please look at the guidance on developing assessment plans for further information. Um, and these samples as well. There's plenty of um, resources you can use when you're cr um, completing these assessments. Okay, so now that we've planned the assessment plan, we've planned the assessment using the assessment plan, it's now time to create our assessment instruments. Now, when you're creating your assessment instruments, there isn't necessarily any sort of template or right way to create them. This is where you have more creativity in designing an assessment instrument based on how you would like to. What we're looking for is that you have clear instructions to the candidate. So here's instructions to the candidate completing a written questionnaire. So provide a written response in the um, spaces below. And we're also looking at basically the assessments that you create. Do they match up to the competency standards within the unit? So we spoke about this before. We didn't just pluck out um, questions just from thin air. We've based these questions on the competency standards within the unit itself. So it seems like in this unit of competency, there's um, some criteria talking about, um, you know, why it's important to make travel arrangements in accordance with policies and procedures. You know, we need to know about some legislation. There's even some budgeting requirements. So this being an assessment instrument is it's giving instructions to the learner on how to complete it. They've actually got the activities in front of them. And because it is an assessment instrument, rem remember from before that the instrument is used to collect the information. Hence why we have this column here as a response column. A learner writes their information in there, writes the answer. That's evidence of them answering that question. They write the answer in here. Um, down the track when you assess them, you can use these columns because therefore you've got the instrument, you've got their evidence, and you can mark it off as whether it's good or not. Okay. So we have a cover sheet as well. Um, having a cover sheet is pretty um, important when it comes to administrative processes. You've probably seen this a lot in the learner workbooks you're completing. But yeah, it's just a way for us to formally mark off your assessments. Okay, here's an example of another assessment instrument. This is a project. So the project um, is based on a learner is organizing business travel and they've been given a simulated example where they have a budget of say $30,000 where um, there's a annual sales conference going to be held in Texas in three months time and four managers in your office are required to attend. So um, this is where the learner would be organizing the business travel, more of a practical example. 
and as part of their project they would need to create or develop these travel documents so as part of organizing business travel there needs to be objectives there needs to be itineraries there needs to be evidence of travel insurance there needs to be names of contacts there needs to be a budget there needs to be instructions for communicating with the office whilst away so these documents which we're asking the learner to send through they are based on the competency standards within the BSB ADM 406 organized business travel unit of competency we're not just plucking them out of thin air again if we thought it was okay just to get them to answer one or two questions then you know why don't we just do that well because these questions these project instructions they are developed in order to assess the learner's competency against the competency standards so again there's no real right way to design your own assessment instruments um, there's no necess not necessarily any templates it's really up to you but just ensure you do follow the hints the guidance the samples and make sure every single dot point is covered and please please ensure that your assessments are developed in order to cover every single competency standard within the unit. So if you pick a unit, you'll need to design your own assessments to cover all of the um, competency standards. We mentioned before that you should try to use at least two different methods of assessment. So um, again, that's for reliability purposes. You might have someone be an absolute gun at knowing all the information about business travel, but they might not exactly know how to create an itinerary so that's why there's a lot of um, different methods that you would use so my suggestion have a have a theoretical um, activity like a written questionnaire and then have a practical um, if there's still some gaps you might need to create a third assessment but there needs to be at least two different methods per unit of competency that's very important all right so that's the assessment instrument and plan in a nutshell Let's talk about mapping. Um, so just before we go into it, mapping should be done in conjunction with designing the assessment instrument. So let's go into that. So like I mentioned, it's very important to be completing the mapping matrix at the same time as creating your assessment instruments. Because again, where do we pull these questions from? I mean, they're certainly relevant to business travel, but why those questions? Again, the answer is we're reflecting on the competency standards. Remember that a learner cannot be deemed competent in a unit unless they are able to demonstrate all of the competency standards within the unit. Please also remember that you can access the competency standards by searching the unit of competency on trainer.gov.au. Now let's take a look at the above question here. So question three. What are some examples of legislation which would impact on business travel? This was a question that I created for this unit of competency. So to be clear, this question I've written. So down here, I've got a screenshot of some of the performance evidence and some of the knowledge evidence from this unit of competency here. If you look up BSB ADM 406 on train.gov.au, you can find this exact information. These are competency standards within this unit. So um, just also remember that the competency standards refers to the elements and performance criteria, as well as the performance evidence and knowledge evidence. You must always ensure you also incorporate the foundation skills and assessment conditions when you're developing your assessments. So the question is, where did I get this question from? Why did I create this question? Are there any particular competency standards you could see where I've created this question from? So just have a bit of a look. All right, so there's the answer. I haven't actually um, written this question just from the top of my head, but rather the question I have written was intended to measure the knowledge evidence item in this green box here. 
As a competency standard, I felt that a written question would have been the best way to measure the learner's knowledge of key provisions of relevant legislation, which could impact on business operations, in particular, business travel. When developing your assessment tools, my advice would be to develop written questions for the knowledge evidence components, as the learners do not need to demonstrate anything physically. For the competency standards within the performance evidence, so these ones here, um, a project or practical activity would probably be the better option as the learner would likely replicate this in the workplace. So just so you can see it again, these are some of the competency standards within BSB ADM 406. I've seen this knowledge evidence highlighted in green about listing key provisions of relevant legis legislation. I've then asked a question which is aimed at directly measuring that knowledge evidence component. So as you can see, I've used a few of the same words from the knowledge evidence. I haven't just copied it and slapped a question mark at the end of it. That doesn't really make sense. Please don't do that, by the way. Um, the question is aimed at measuring this knowledge evidence component. As you probably can all guess, but what I've just demonstrated there is called mapping. Mapping is the process of justifying the relationship between the competency standard and the assessment instrument. In my opinion, mapping is one of the most important concepts in the training industry. The mapping matrix you develop would demonstrate your justification. It is usually an internal document which the learner doesn't see. Alright, so it's probably easy to show you a practical example to demonstrate the concept of mapping. So mapping is usually demonstrated in a matrix, which identifies the competency standards and what items within the assessment tool were designed to meet these competency standards. As we identified before, question three was designed to measure the knowledge evidence item in green. So we're talking about key provisions. These are the competency standards copied and pasted from train.gov.au. Now you do not necessarily need multiple questions or observations to demonstrate performance in a competency standard. However, the more you do conclude, include, the more reliable your assessment will be. The trick to developing assessment tools is to try and develop a short and succinct tool which covers all of the competency standards at least once and meets the rules of evidence. So it might come as a shock, but the workbooks you've been completing were designed in this manner. When you consider the amount of competency standards within each of these units, you might actually find that the workbooks are actually relatively small to what they could be. When you begin to develop your assessment tools, you'll need to ensure they cover all the competency standards within the unit. Please ensure you cover every single competency standard within the unit. So in the mapping matrix on the left hand column, I copy and paste all the competency standards. I then have several columns, um, a different column for each of my assessments. So in this column, I have a written questions. This is telling me, or it's telling everyone, that within all of the assessment instruments I've created for this unit, that question two and question three combined are used to measure this knowledge evidence component here. Okay. As you can see, there's an example up here where I've only got one question dedicated to a knowledge evidence. And you can even see here that I've got multiple questions um, from using different assessments as well. So I've got questions and I've got some items in the practical assessment. Okay, nothing in the oral discussion is measured in here. That might come a bit later. Okay. Really important when you're doing a mapping is be specific. Um, if you've got question three, and it's measured to a certain criteria. Question three, it, it makes life so much easier if your mapping matrix is really clear. That way, if I need to look at the assessment instrument and find out well, where this person create this question from, I can go back to the mapping matrix and go, ha ha, it's there. So um, yeah, really important with your mapping to be really um, accurate as well as being really, um, yeah, just clear with how you're describing where the, um, what's being measured in the assessments. Alright, so here's another example. So 
I've got a couple more questions from the BSB ADM 406 written questionnaire. And what I've got on the second half here is I've screen captured um, elements two and three from this unit of competency from training.gov.au. Now, just having a look at the questions and a look at some of the competency standards, um, why don't we have a bit of a guess as to where I've created these questions from? Okay, I think I was just hovering my cursor over it, so I've probably alluded to it already. But um, as you can see, the questions have been designed to measure the competency standards within element three. So let's have a look. My question is, list three ways business travel costs could be paid. Okay. Performance criteria 3.1 says, check and confirm methods of payment. So it's fairly similar. Question seven, how would you make credit arrangements when organizing overseas travel? 3.2, make credit arrangements in accordance with organizational policies and procedures. So as you can see, these, these questions are tapping into these performance criteria. They're not taken word for word because um, an important distinction is that the criteria you're seeing on train.gov.au, they're just competency standards. They don't tell you how to assess anything they don't tell you what content needs to be demonstrated they're just saying here's what we need to see as an um, from a learner to ensure they meet the national benchmark so it's up to us as um, assessment tool developers to develop assessments which meet which meet those benchmarks So the mapping matrix for this, this, for this assessment tool also identifies how the competency standards are measured. You probably noticed that the questions on their own might not have been sufficient for the purpose of demonstrating competency in these performance criteria. Therefore, these competency standards are also measured elsewhere in the practical assessment. So that's basically saying that answering question six and question seven doesn't cover all these criteria as a whole. There's still some more evidence that I need, hence why I've created some items in the practical assessment. The idea with mapping is to help you conduct valid assessments against the competency standards. By developing tools which are designed to meet these standards, you can safely assume that by assessing a learner using the assessment, the learner, by achieving a satisfactory result for each item, has successfully demonstrated competency and can acquire a statement of, of attainment proving so. As you might be aware, by having the statement of attainment showing which units of competency you have completed assumes that you have met every single competency standard within that unit. Thus, it is a major compliance issue if your assessment tools do not cover every single competency standard in the unit as you will be awarding the learner competency when in fact they might not be demonstrating all of the competency standards. And we spoke a lot about this in the first webinar, about the importance of assessing a learner against all competency standards. We, there is a lot of negative direct and indirect effects if a learner is not assessed against all the competency standards. They can only be assessed against all the competency standards if the assessment tools to begin with cover them all. So if ASQA suspects that your assessment tools are not up to scratch, then chances are they'll be very critical on your mapping matrix. When you're reviewing the sample assessment tools, be sure to review how the assessment plan, assessment instruments, and mapping matrix are all consistent with each other. Okay, so we've spoken about assessment plans, we've spoken about assessment instruments, and we've spoken about mapping. Now let's talk about the assessor guide. When developing your assessment tool and after you developed an evidence slash mapping matrix, you will need to develop an assessor guide. In essence, the assessor guide contains instructions for the assessor to conduct a valid assessment. It assumes that anyone with industry knowledge can conduct an assessment using the assessment tool and be able to make valid judgments regarding the learner's performance. To ensure this happens, the assessor guide will need to contain sample or benchmark responses. It is just another name for a marking sheet and all assessors should be using assessor guide when conducting assessments. For written-based assessments, such as what you're mostly doing in this course, the assessor, which could be myself, 
has in possession a list of all the benchmark answers, i.e. the correct answers. By meeting the benchmark responses, the learner has adequately demonstrated their competency. For more practical assessments, such as a demonstration, the assessor might have a list of competency standards the learner will need to meet. They would also have a list of sample observations that they would be expecting to witness. So the assessor guide is basically just the assessment instrument, just with the answers. So you're taking out the instructions to the student and you're changing it to instructions to the assessor. So here's how you mark, here's where the instructions are, etc., etc., And you're providing the answers in the assessor guide because yeah, if, if you're assessing someone, assessing say five people against the one unit of competency, you need to make sure that to make a valid and reliable judgment, you need to have a benchmark. And again, the benchmark is just the, the answers or the guides, but it's just so ensure that you're not kind of guessing what the expected answer is. You're kind of looking at the benchmarks as a minimum and that's all the benchmark is. It's a minimum expected observation or minimum expected response. So if you're looking for examples of assessor guides, look at the samples. Um, you'll see that they're very closely aligned to the assessment instruments themselves. So give that a look. Um, that'll, the assessor guide makes a lot of sense once you've done the plans, the instruments and the mapping. One of the new additions to the TA ASS 401 unit is the need for all trainers to identify modifications and contextualization requirements. Contextualization is basically the same thing as customizing the assessment tool to make it relevant to the learner's needs. As you can see, there are a few reasons why you might need to contextualize an assessment tool. First, you can contextualize the assessment to meet the needs of the learner's particular industry. For example, the unit of competency you make a presentation is used in many different industries, such as in education, work health and safety, marketing, music, and many others. When developing an assessment tool for this unit, you might need to consider the legislative requirements or particular standards held within that industry. Second, you can contextualize an assessment tool to meet the needs of the learner in their particular workplace. Different organizations have different policies and procedures, so why not make the assessments relevant to what the learner needs to demonstrate? If you have an assessment tool on using business technology, where the learner needs to use the printer a lot, then perhaps you could customize the assessment to focus on using a printer. Another way you can contextualize the assessment tool is to meet the learner's areas of expertise or interest. In a way, the course you are currently completing provides some evidence of a contextualization because we always suggest that you develop your documents based on your specific area of interest or expertise. There will be no point creating five assessment tools on units within the hospitality industry when your key area of interest is engineering. As we offer an online course catering for all individuals, we offer this flexibility to ensure all learners have the same freedom to contextualize the assessments to suit their personal interest. Finally, customizing the assessment tool to meet the LN needs of a learner could also happen in an assessment environment. After you have determined the LN levels of your learners, you might have identified that one of these learners requires assistance with their writing skills. Perhaps you could customize the assessment tool to turn your written questionnaire into an oral questionnaire. When you are developing an assessment tool, or whether you are using a pre-existing assessment tool, a good habit would be to check the advice of the training package developers regarding how you might contextualize assessments. Also, any changes you make to a pre-existing assessment because you've contextualized it will need to be noted somewhere. This will most likely occur on the assessment cover sheet. Okay, so moving on to the projects. Now, there was a lot to cover within this webinar. Um, when you're completing your projects, keep in mind those key things that we spoke about. There's the assessment plans, the assessment instruments, the mapping matrices, and the assessor guides. Now, we're going to talk about project one here because project one focuses on the more formal types of assessments, so written questioning or observing a practical demonstration. So in project one, you'll be required to plan, design, and develop three sets of assessment tools that cover three different units of competency. 
So what's in the assessment tool? Well, an assessment tool contains an assessment plan. We also need to review the assessment plan. We will also require at least six different assessment instruments. Now, what that means is there should at least be two assessment instruments per unit of competency. Part of the instructions state that we need at least two different methods per unit of competency, hence why you need six different assessment instruments. So two for each unit. And I guess also therefore, for each you need an assessor guide for every assessment instrument. So the you need at least six assessor guides, which should be consistent with the assessment instruments. You'll also need a mapping matrix for each of the units you select. So therefore you're justifying where and why you um, created your assessment instructions or questions or observations. You also need to do a few reviews. So you're reviewing against VET-based content as well as doing three, I guess, more in-depth reviews of your assessment tool, kind of like a trialing session. Okay, so um, you might think that this is a fairly in-depth project. Um, you're right. It is, there, there is a lot of repetition because you need to do everything threefold. Um, like we spoke about at the start of this webinar, there is an issue with the quality of assessment tools as a general, um, in general within the VET sector. So we need to ensure that from the, uh, from the foundations that people with the TA4016 qualifications um, know how to design an assessment tool and can at least identify what sets apart a good assessment tool from a not so good assessment tool. So in the in webinar seven, which is the next webinar, we're going to be talking about RPL and project two. So if you'd like to jump on to that one, um, the first half of the webinar will focus on RPL and project two. So um, again, what we've spoken about here concerns project one. So um, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for watching this webinar. If you have any questions, please call the office on one 737 006. You can also email your trainer or you can email trainer at ilec.edu.au. So I hope everyone got a lot out of this. This is probably the, the meatier part of your qualification. So use the samples, use the guidance. Um, this one is, is a fairly big one. So best of luck when you're completing your um, project one.